six months ago, all eyes were on the BBC as they deliberated on how to deal with one of their most successful but outspoken presenters. Petitions were drawn up, death threats issued, and the press was speculating on the outcome of the Jeremy Clarkson incident when he hit his producer for providing a cold meal. How did it come to this? How powerful is talent, or should it be, within a production? Where do you draw the line on bad behaviour? And is top talent really irreplaceable? Are we over-reliant on such a small pool of talent that we are vastly overpaying for their services? So, here to discuss all of this, I'm joined by Stuart Murphy, Director of Sky Entertainment Channels, Jonathan Shallett, Chair of uh, Top Talent Agency, Royal International, and Danielle Larks, Managing Director of CPR Productions. So, let's uh, start with Jeremy. So, he hits somebody and actually it then becomes quite an easy decision for the BBC in a way because I think everybody would accept that hitting somebody in the junior position shoot is completely unacceptable. But what would you have done in the situation? But what would you have done earlier? Would you have seen, did you see? Yeah. Um, I mean, I love the fact you said hitting someone in a junior position <laughs> is unacceptable. <laughs> Especially. Whereas, you know... Um, well, I remember, so, I remember famously um, the story about somebody hitting Mark Thompson in a corridor and yeah. nobody wept about that. Yeah. <laughs> they were threatened to be fired if they'd missed, I think. Um, <clears throat> uh, what would you... So, blah, blah. Well, firstly, hats off to the BBC. I think you can't have a set of values that you live by and a whole organisation corrals behind and then you junk them the moment uh, one of your presenters goes rogue. And I phoned... Uh, Danny Cohen to say, you've got our support, um, uh, and spoke to my equivalent to other broadcasters. I think you can't have someone doing that. Imagine if it was someone's daughter or uh, uh, someone in a higher position. Um, uh, and um, I think it was against a backdrop of someone sniggering about use of the N-word, um, uh, saying the word slope. It wasn't even... What would you have done then, though? What would you have done during... I mean, it's, tr it's tricky because certain talent loves having a door to push against. And the moment you go public with, a, uh, with pulling someone up on an issue, that, they will probably love that. So everyone's got different ways of dealing with things. I guess any conversation with um, talent like Jeremy Clarkson will inevitably go public. Um, but you'd probably want to have a conversation. You'd probably want to find a way where he could save face... Um, you could save face, this is way before the incident, and, I don't know, put them on a show where um, he wasn't kind of encouraged or expected to say things that were just on the other side of acceptable, which Top Gear was and is. Um, so you'd probably, I guess, put him on a military history series <laughs> or something. Um, but I you wouldn't have been able to, in all honesty, you wouldn't have been able to do that. You, know, you wouldn't be able to have a conversation with Jer Jeremy saying, well, actually, I'm going to take you off Top Gear. And he'd say, that's, that's fine. I suppose you'd find, I mean, God, it's, it's so specific. I, you, I guess you would find a reason to say production was stopped for a bit. It, it looked like he was headed in that direction, I think. I think you look at his articles in The Sun that um, uh, push the boundaries, and people love him for pushing the boundaries. I think he had a history of pushing the boundaries on Top Gear, put people in a really difficult position, I think Danny in a really difficult position. Um, and I think it was, uh, you know, the fact that no other broadcaster came out criticising the BBC shows that I think we all felt pretty much the same. Dan? Could it have been avoided? Could this have been avoided? Well, broadly speaking, I think that we have to accept talent are human beings. They respond to care and nurturing and understanding. And good management comes from a great relationship with them. Having said that, of course, you're com both completely right. There's a moral line there. You cannot condone physical abuse. You can't condone bullying in any form whatsoever. So, of course, the BBC made the right decision at that point. But, you know, we all like to reduce the argument down to he didn't have a hot meal. Well, I'm sorry, he probably should have had a hot meal, but the response is not to punch somebody. We need to care about the talent and nurture them, and that's the only way to manage them. Like, you can't penalise them. You, well, they're not at school. We're not hand out detentions, you've got to manage them by caring about them and really... So, Jonathan, he's your client. Would you have said, well, you should have had a hot meal? What would you have said to him? Um, clearly, if he's my client, I've got to defend my clients. And but try privately? And be, privately, I would have said, you're an idiot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's not much more to say. And I think that... I, 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 
think the BBC, being a public service broadcaster, have got a different situation, a set of standards that a commercial broadcaster has got. I mean, Channel 4, you know, regularly have, I mean, Danny Ball is always controversial. Would Danny Ball have been fired on the BBC, whereas Channel 4 can embrace him? Possibly, yeah. yes. I think if you're a commercial broadcaster and you... But, but the public taxpayer are paying and I think we all know in television that some people have, very, have been very well known in the industry who have been senior producers particularly in ITV who were fired for bullying and you can't have executives fired for bullying but the presenters are not. No. I don't think it, I don't even think it's fine for commercial broadcasters to sign no, up someone I was going to ask like you that I mean obviously Clarkson. it was a big financial implication to the BBC but you know obviously you're working for a very commercial organisation would that have had to have come into the reckoning? Um, no, I mean, we're, we're really strident about our values. We're a family brand. We, it's really important if people are paying for us every month that we reflect their values as well. Um, the discussion we had at work lasted literally 10 seconds. I mean, we'd had it, you know, issues several years ago on Sky Sports. Um, uh, someone said at Exec, um, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's a valuable brand. You can't just junk your values the moment something with a huge pound sign comes along. No. It would have been, you know, short-term gain for long-term... Uh, long-term mess, I think. He's not someone we want to work with. Um, or, uh, and th that's no, but it's a harder decision when he's actually on the payroll, as it were, isn't it? Uh, I guess so, but who nowadays is happy with someone saying the word nigger? I'm sorry. No, uh, you know, no. not acceptable. No, but that happened before. It did, it did, ha it, it absolutely did happen before. And, and it, you know, his, his view was it wasn't transmitted. Um, but come on, people who use, use that word, you no need to say that. It's not like people were going to be in outrage because he hadn't completed the 1970s rhyme. <laughs> and, um, you know, and then for him to be so tentative about, about an apology um, and loving the fact that he was a naughty schoolboy, grow up. You know, it's a different age. Grow up. Has he had the last laugh, Jonathan? This huge deal he's done with Amazon. I think he's definitely had the last laugh. I mean, I mean, I was talking to a very senior executive who made an offer to Jeremy to the to the Top Gear boys. I mean, one of the kind of Sony Universal type companies, and they offered him a five-year or the, the, the Top Gear franchise a five-year deal. The Top Gear guys didn't want to do a five-year deal; they wanted to do a three-year deal. And Amazon had given them an astronomical amount of money for three years. So, yes, they probably have had the last laugh. The only challenge Jeremy Clark is going to have, he's not going to be seen by many people on television now, which people forget very quickly. Yep. So, in three years' time, he may struggle to come back into a prime time position. But equally, he's made, in his view, enough money to go and retire. So, he's had the laugh last by his, yeah. by his definition of what a last laugh is. I'm not so sure about. Richard Hammond, for example, because Richard Hammond's becoming a bit of a national treasure and loved by people. And I admire his loyalty to Clarkson, but I wonder if it's misguided, because Richard Hammond could have gone on to become a very significant mainstream presenter and grown considerably. I think it's fascinating that really Top, top Gear, to me, felt like it was a comedy show among three middle-aged men laughing about the demise of their kind of virility or, or attractiveness or anything, you know, just kind of yeah. mucking about. Uh, cars were a great backdrop, but really it's about three men being funny, I think. And the way they're funny is by being politically incorrect and slightly bumbling and getting things wrong and being a bit sexist. And it's a tricky setup to start with, a really popular setup, but yeah. it's already nudging at the boundaries. And um, uh, so, you know, I think Richard Hammond does well to extricate himself from that kind of that type of tone. We've just done a show yeah. with him, worked really well, people clearly love him, he's a national treasure, yeah. treasurette. Um, <laughs> but, uh, treasure. It was already a difficult tone. Yeah. And I, I'm excited to see what Chris Evans is going to do. Yeah, I think we all are. So, Dan, you've worked with lots of talent over the years. We've seen that Jeremy Clarkson is going to be replaced. Is talent ir irreplaceable? Can you replace talent? S I suppose Top Gear is the, the, the kind of most potent example at the moment. So, in a sense, that talent are not directly replaceable. However, if the vehicle that they work on, the show that they work on is good, you can repurpose that or skew it slightly so that it'll accommodate the authorship of somebody like Chris Evans. So they're not directly replaceable. It's not just the face who trots on. Where there is a level of authorship at the heart of what they do, uh, if it's just mouthing words and wearing a suit, perhaps. But in, invariably, those... The people that we cherish are the ones that imbue those shows with authorship. And that's why, you know, it is hard to um, keep shows running without them, but it is not impossible. They cannot be replaced, but they ca the shows can be skewed to adapt to that authorship. What do you think, Cameron? 
I think we're all replaceable. Anybody who thinks they're not replaceable is very foolish. It's interesting you mentioned Chris Evans because they're... Do you tell that to your clients? No, because I, I don't want my clients to leave me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I advise, I, never, I always say to a client, if they throw, throw a tantrum and they're on a hit show, I, never, I always say, never quit a hit. Whatever yes. your perception, how you're treated, if you're on a hit show, stay there. Um, I'm sure Adrian Charles would agree with that now. Totally. I think Adrian Charles, I mean, particularly Christine Bleakley, she stayed at the BBC, she would have probably gone on to be the Saturday Night Queen. And I think she was very misguided, whether it was her or the way she advised. But going back to uh, Chris Evans, you know, when he took over, people are saying, will he or will he not be a successor to Jeremy Clarkson on Top Gear? All I can say in response to that is when he took over from Terry Wogan on Radio 2, everybody said Terry Wogan was the king, yeah. not replaceable. Mm. Chris Evans gets more viewers, or listeners, shall I say. So I think people clearly are replaceable, and people also have a moment. You know, yes, you have a moment where you are the, the, the king. I mean, Philip Schofield's had his moment for a while. Other people have their moment. But that moment can pass, and it can pass very quickly if you become arrogant with it. So if talent is replaceable, do we overpay them? We pay them too much? Sky never overpays talent. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, uh, do we overpay them? Blimey, that's such a... <clears throat> I mean, when we look at talent, we work out what job they're going to do for us. You know, if they're going to be, um, if they're going to, you know, as you say, just someone who dresses and kind of speaks the lines, then pay them a particular thing as a subscription broadcaster. If they're going to sell the wider subscription message, then we pay them more. And how do you uh, judge that? So really, as scientifically as one can, we, we research, um, uh, we ask, I think it's 3,000 people how they feel about 500 names uh, every six months. We ask them, do you know them? Do you like them? Are they on the way up? Do you want to see more of them? And, you know, some people, they know them, they like them, they're on the way up, they don't want to see more of them. And, um, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and, um, so they so have to tick all the boxes? Yeah, I mean, you know, interesting things where a small amount of people know them, um, uh, but those who know them adore them. They think they're on the way up and they really want to see more of them. I mean, that's an interesting thing. You yeah. think they're kind of about to get to their uh, sort of zenith. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, we do that once every six months. Um, and then there's a kind of gut thing that you think, generally, this is the audience we're after to move from Freeview over to Sky. We have a, a chart which, is, which measures people uh, according to their intention to purchase Sky. Uh, the one to threes, those really difficult people to shift, um, are really warmed up by talent and content as opposed to deals or other things. Yeah. Um, and so we'd look at the audience demographic of the one to three intentions to purchase, match that against talent, and, um, and go after them. And that's probably where we'd pay people quite good money to muck around in Game of Thrones costumes while talking about Sky Plus HD. <laughs> But each, you know, it has a different value to each broadcaster. Yeah. So in the conversations that we had when we got commissioned for the League of Their Own pilot, which was a format with no talent, you know, the conversations with Sky were consistently, what's the poster going to look like? Who are the people on that poster that are going to reach out and encourage people to buy the box and watch the programme? And there's a different value that they bring. And in a world where there's so much spend is now on marketing brand and branding, they are absolutely the personification of that. They, they embody it. So when it goes horribly wrong and Jeremy does things that absolutely fly in the face of uh, the I brand of the BBC, then it's bad. But when it's good, it, it's absolutely inextricably linked You're with right. the channel in a, brand. In a world where brands are so promiscuous and Breaking Bad can be on several channels yeah. or Family Guy can be, <clears throat> you know, you're, and there's so much noise. When you're driving, driving down a road, you've got a three-second dwell time on a poster. <laughs> Um, you know, you need something that short circuits to your values, you know, what, what you're trying to say about the channel that it's on. Um, and but, not but, that marketing campaigns then, are just posters. But then but aren't we going to be picking from how you're ever going to broaden the talent base if you're, you know, if you're picking from your list of, of names that people already know? Are the days over? You're talking about a comedy panel show. So let's go back to the start of Have I Got News For You, which amazingly was nearly 25 years ago. And it started with three pretty much completely unknowns. Jimmy always says it was a happy accident. Is that, will that never happen again? The answer is there'll always be happy accidents. There'll be talent. No, but will, will we ever be able to cast a show for people purely on what you think is their talent, what you think their chemistry will be, but not for what the audience knows about them because well, they are it, unknowns? If it's a prime time expensive show that's got advertisers 
sort of move BBC from that in particular. The answer is you've got to give the public at home what they want. And if you meet an absolute genius who you have complete faith, if you're the, the controller of the channel like Stuart, you can occasionally t t t take a punt. But the reality is, are you really as a broadcaster going to give the public at home someone they don't know and they've got no experience I, of life? But, 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 but the public, but the public it is. do know... They, they know immediately what they like and they don't like. They usually know better than all of us. But they might not turn it on without the name of the talent being promoted. They may not know that what that show is without the name of the talent being associated with it. It's a, real, it's a complete shortcut. There's no intellectual appreciation. There is a heart dynamic that says, I love him, I'm going to watch so that. So how, how are we going to get new well, talent? But just, Jane, the, the thing is, it also depends what channel it is. So I think you absolutely could cast a complete bunch of unknowns on Comedy Central because you go to Comedy Central knowing that it's going to be funny and the, it's, it's got a certain tone about it. Much harder in the very big broadcasters. But clearly... The way to do it is we do need, we absolutely aren't good enough at it and we're not reaching out into the pool of talented people out there. We've got to bring those people on and each broadcaster needs to think of the way to do it and each independent and uh, studio needs to think of the way to do it. And it may be that you do have, you wouldn't have all three unknown, but you might have two of them unknown. I'm not sure I agree a broadcaster has to do anything. A broadcaster has to give programmes. The only thing a broadcaster has to do is give a programme to their audience their audience want. And if there is a particular character yeah. and there's an opportunity to give someone new that character to play or that presenting role and there's nobody out there who's already well known, then absolutely. And uh, we regularly get briefs and broadcasters saying they're looking for someone new in property or new in digital or technology the public don't know because that channel have said, we want to try somebody new. And when I guess shows like BBC Breakfast or Good Morning Britain because you've got an ensemble show that's already got a guaranteed audience, you've got a better chance of giving someone a platform but to go forward. It becomes the commercially self-defeating if you assume that somebody else is going to nurture the talent and you can pick it. The new talent you've got does to, come you've along. Got to, I'm but, sure, as an industry. Well, I'm sure that Sheridan Smith knew at one point someone would have given her a job and yeah. she became this wonderful national treasure. So the answer is, if you go and audition for a role and you're right for that role, that director it may champion you. It was probably Stuart, you. actually, yeah, that gave her a break. Yeah. No, it wasn't. It wasn't. It was someone else. But um, I think <clears throat> the ideal thing is you definitely want a mix and you want certain people who are unknown that you can grow who are inextricably linked to your brand. Um, and even if they go, and ideally they go to other brands and people still misattribute them back to your brand. I remember when we worked together at the BBC, all three of us, and um, uh, you know, we knew there was a problem with BBC comedy because if there was a comedy that was great on the BBC, people would say, well, it must be Channel 4. I mean, that's the worst possible <laughs> position to be in, um, uh, unless you're Channel 4. And um, so ideally you want to mix. I mean, I think one of the joys about um, BBC Three as was and, and still will be ideally is that you could take people who weren't yet fully formed and grow them and expose them to an audience who can watch them morph into something that is uh, kind of consistent and people are familiar with and love um, and it's helpful to have platforms where someone can turn up as a kind of nebulous thing and get produced into a consistent kind of offer that mm. goes out there I think so my issue when, when I'm chatting to the channel heads about who we sign up is, is, is mainly about whether they're known, but when they're unknown, it's about whether they are going to arrive fully formed. So you look at HBO and their track record, Lena, Dun Lena Dunham, you know, who wrote and stars in Girls. Yeah. They signed her, ostensibly unknown, but really she arrived fully formed and she was a thing. She was crafted, the edges were kind of scraped off and she made sense to an audience instantly. So you didn't have a slow burn of people watching inconsistent And yet one of your most her. successful shows, I don't think anybody, many people knew who Carl Pilkington was. Carl didn't really know who Carl Pilkington was. <laughs> Three years. Yeah, you know, and all channels, all channels have, have those shows. You know, it was, it was great, but, you know, even there, in, in, uh, in the spirit of openness and honesty, you know, we needed a Ricky. Everyone yeah. needs a Ricky to have a Carl. <laughs> and, you know, we needed Ricky Gervais who could yeah. endorse this person. Springboard. Yeah, you know, we've tr we have tried with new talent. I just don't think audiences expect Sky to do that. But we often talk that people come to Sky for... People go to some of the public service channels for a, uh, a long-term relationship. People come to Sky for a treat and a dirty weekend. Um, <laughs> but we tie them in for 18 months for that yeah. <laughs> but, but on, um, But we did do it on League of Their Own because people yeah. knew who James Corden was, but John Bishop had only done a 10-minute yeah. slot on Live at the Apollo. You know, if you were a comedy fan, you probably knew him, but not to TV audiences. So why do you think there's been such a long history of big talent, big popular shows, 
switching channels and suddenly they fall from grace very quickly. And that goes back many, many years to Morecambe and Wise and Bruce Forsyth, right up to, we're talking about Adrian Charles and Christine Bleakley and Des Lineham, and so many people have, have jumped across to another channel and discovered they weren't quite as popular as they thought they were. Well, I think, first of all, there have also been successes. So one shouldn't, mm. for example, when Graham Norton Graham went from is, Channel yeah. 4 to the BBC, I think some people were cynical in the beginning, the BBC stuck with him, and he's now a completely loved national figure. Yeah, I that think was Lorraine and me, Lorraine sitting there in the front. <laughs> I think <laughs> if, if you look at BBC to ITV, and we talk about sports presenters like Des Lynham, I think there's serious career misguidance, either by himself or his agent. Because when you're on BBC presenting sports, you fill in the gaps between the sport. On ITV, the ads fill lots of the gaps. You get lot, you get lot less um, screen time. So as a sports broadcaster, you lose out considerably if you're going to join an advertising channel for the simple reason I just explained. I also think... But it's not just that, is it? Because you no, know, Trini and Susanna left a hugely successful show at the BBC, went to ITV, it's more or less the same show. Nobody wanted to watch it. What, what's going on there? I think when, you know, as you look at your brand and you want to gather people in that brand who can add to it and enrich it, and so there's a simple thing that if you get talent who come and they're bigger than the brand, it, it, the wheels come off and it kind of, there's a rub there and it doesn't quite work. I think there's a kind of philosophical point that viewers love um, uh, actors and presenters on screen who they feel they know. And if that person on screen is doing their job, they're saying, hi, welcome to this show on ITV. ITV's great. They're on the posters. For, to see them next week saying, I'm now sleeping with Channel 4. They're <laughs> absolutely great. There's something that feels odd and a bit disingenuous when, when the move happens quickly. Yeah. I think sometimes people hire talent thinking an audience will just come with them. <clears throat> Lots of people had it with Chris Moyles on Radio 1, yeah. thinking put him on TV and an audience will uh, you know, seamlessly migrate. And, and it, it doesn't oft, you know, often doesn't happen. So people don't, don't carefully think of the vehicle that will best um, show the talent, and ideally show the talent in a way that hasn't been seen before. And so it properly looks like a kind of reawakening of that, that talent's yeah. personality, I guess. There's a difference uh, between scripted and non-scripted yeah. in that context. In that scripted talent, they go for a great role, and if the role's great, they will get accolades yeah, for that okay, whatever yeah. channel. But if you're a non-scripted talent, you've got to be liked as a person. So, for example, when Christine Bleakley started at the BBC, massively popular, but then she moved to ITV, and the Daily Mail managed to portray her as a very greedy individual. Mm. So all of a sudden, people who liked her on 25,000 a year started resenting this person. Um, I'm not saying that's Christine's fault necessarily, because it wasn't her that announced to the press that she was going for money, but that certainly came out. And I think um, Susanna Reid's has suffered to a, a certain extent, not as badly as Susanna Re um, Christine Bleakley, but and equally she's pulling it back now because she's, she's a real quality presenter. However, at the beginning of her journey to ITV, the Daily Mail again launched a continual attack on her and talked about things in her private life um, which weren't helpful. But so it's very important to be liked. And if you are going to move channels, I think it's very important to construct it in a positive way as yeah. to why you've done it to make sure that love follows you. I wonder if that's always going to be the same, though. I, you know, it suits us and it comforts us to think that, that uh, you know, channels launch people and they ought to be faithful because if they leave they're, they're you know going to be unpopular but you know in a world now where we we saw it with comedians so when i was at the bbc and you're negotiating with comedians they don't have to work on television they sell out the alcohol yep. hall they get revenue from dvds they get revenue from books they do not need to be on television and increasingly there are many outlets for personalities, for authors of content to become brands in their own right. You know, we, when I was at Channel 4, everybody talked about, you know, the, the effect of friends and wherever you put friends, people would find it, whatever secondary channel, people would find it. And increasingly, I wonder whether we are living in a world in which those brands are less program brands and more the brands that surround people. Yeah, but you, you talk about friends. You don't mention Matt LeBlanc. The, no, the but this, that, that was 20 was, years friends. ago, Jane. I mean, we're, we're talking about a world where people can, you know, I've been talking to my colleagues at, at YouTube and hearing, you know, people can ask Twitter. We talked about six million people follow Holly Willoughby. She doesn't always, her only voice is not through the airwaves of a broadcaster. She has a persona and a personality. They, I, and I'm simply throwing out the question for the future as to whether those people, the talent, are going to be 
the on-screen exemplars of our channel brands, but also of their own brand. They're going to be, uh, it's going to be a different world. And it's a question, it's, I don't know the answer, but I'm... It's, it, is it going to be hard to make talent? You know, you've set very high targets for you know, diversity on scale, which is fantastic. How are we going to make the talent pool more diverse if we are fishing in this exclusive, your list? Yeah, so um, we force people to hire new talent. It's the kind of short, shortcut answer. Um, I think we incentivize people, incentivize indies, and say, we're going to have a much more rewarding conversation. You're going to have a meeting pretty damn quickly if you've got unknown talent that's not, not a white man in his 60s pointing at something static. Um, <laughs> although I love TV like that. Um, <laughs> and um, so you partly yeah. incentivize people. You partly have a conversation when it comes to presenters saying, what about this list of people? Um, I think we look to a great, strong BBC and Channel 4, particularly, to bring on new talent. Spin-off channels like ITV2 and E4 and BBC3, um, as well as YouTube. Um, I guess YouTube people interact in a different way to talent on those networks. It's possibly more soundbite in some cases. In other cases, it's like Sakoni Jolies that my kids are obsessed with. Um, uh, you know, they'll watch hours of the stuff, people just wandering around their kitchen. Um, so it's a kind of Truman Show type relationship. But um, uh, I, think, I think that's why we need a strong TV ecology. It's not Sky's job. Uh, and people that come to Sky for new talent, um, we can really, in drama, we can absolutely cast. Um, so it's not just white talent. We, I, I was just saying earlier, I was at dinner last night for a new drama we're doing. It's like two white characters in the ensemble lead of ten, ten characters. Um, uh, but it's, it's tricky. It's tricky. And I, th and I think it's slightly embarrassing that we haven't got it right. No, you know, no, really but, but it's hard, isn't it? When, when you feel you have to have somebody with six million Twitter followers, it's really hard then to increase the, to increase the talent pool. Well, and yeah, I mean, we say it's hard, but TV is full of really bright people. We're all well-meaning. People are pretty liberal-minded and want to encourage us. Everyone, everyone wants to do the right thing and actually make Britain a better place, I think it's fair to say. It's just annoying that we haven't cracked it between <laughs> us, but fortunately we're, we're getting there. I think there's lots of momentum. So. Okay, let's open it up. Uh, Questions you want answered. Looking for a, looking for a hand. <clears throat> Hi, Daniel Tool. It's a non-corporate question, so I won't say where I'm from. Um, if you were to advise a young, aspiring future TV presenter, um, just starting out, even before they've started out, um, you know, given the new mediums we have today, what would you be telling them they should be doing to learn their craft? Uh, let's say they're still sort of early in their school age. I would say, I would say, learn your craft by doing your craft. Whatever you want to do, go and do it. Practice on your friends, take advantage of facilities at school or university in terms of television facilities there. And then I would say, if you want to go to a broadcaster, someone new, and you want me to take you, have a passion for something. Because if I call up broadcasters, I've got someone fantastic, they're going to say, so what? But if I call up and say, I've got someone who's fantastic, who's an expert at this, and there's a gap in that area, then all of a sudden there's a conversation to be had. I, th I think that's, uh, I'd echo that. I think work out what your passion is, kind of learn your voice, and so film yourself a lot. I think, and then probably if you do end up with a whole load of followers on social media, don't be arrogant enough, I guess, to assume that kind of old media can't help you. So one of the conversations we've had at work is, do we blind, sort of semi-blindly sign up people who have a great social following, but actually don't adhere to our values again? So there's, a couple, there's a guy called KSI, brilliant talent on YouTube. Actually, a lot of his jokes and a lot of how he carries himself out is pretty misogynistic. It's a, it's a joke, but you know, he's got seven million impressionable followers, including two uh, you know, in my household. <laughs> And, um, and actually, I think one of the reasons British TV is amazing is we have a pre agreed set of standards about taste and decency and respect, fairness, uh, accuracy. And I actually think new media talent um, could absolutely learn from that and should do with a kind of mor moral responsibility on the next generation of consumers to give them the quality of, um, of kind of uh, taste and respect that, that we have on kind of so called old media. Is that why you think, actually, you know, we have all these 
people with huge followings, but relatively s small thus far, small transfer from new media. I think, to be honest, to be honest, Jane, they don't actually need to turn up for a meeting no. with me. You know, they've got purple-plated Lamborghinis, <laughs> um, and uh, like most of the people in this audience, and um, <laughs> so they, like most of the people in this audience, they don't need me. So I need to, um, I need to proactively make, you know, sh show them the benefits of coming to Sky, and. Um, and, and I guess, ultimately, how it can be a virtuous circle. I guess also, if we're being honest, that Sky needs to uh, be possibly more unclenched about a paywall and help talent exist outside a paywall as well as within a paywall. So someone like Ruth Jones, who writes Stella for us, yeah. is absolutely in our interests for her to have a national platform for people to see how great she is just for two episodes and then come back to us for 20. <laughs> I've so. watched every episode. Um, <laughs> Uh, hello, Jake from Broadcast Magazine. Uh, I just wondered, uh, this has come up this week again, uh, politicians bashing the BBC for how much it pays talent. Do you think that's fair? Is that just the general? Uh, yes, that's right. Well, Dan, you pick, it, you pick up. I think it goes back to, somebody said it earlier, you know, each channel has a different priority, and because the BBC is funded in a special way, they need to think slightly differently. However, you know, the BBC is there to entertain a broad audience. And on occasion, uh, you know, big, big talent uh, who do author programmes, who do have something to contribute. I mean, you wouldn't, we wouldn't be saying this uh, about Peter Kay. You know, Peter Kay gets paid because he writes, he creates, he directs. Those, that sort of authorship is just part of the creative ecology. But are, are you not... Are you not all just driving up the cost of talent because they know they can? I mean, is, people are people prepared away. to walk people away, walk away? all the time? Do yeah, I mean, certainly um, in my experience of being at the BBC, we had to um, walk away from several negotiations because they were just too rich. And you know where your breaking point is. And it goes back to what Stuart was saying, which is it depends on the value for that particular channel. I mean, Jimmy I'm, Malvel always used to say when it came to negotiations with Angus Deaton, he, Draw the line, you know, yeah, you he, will, he will not walk away. And what's more, the show will be fine without him. And it was. <laughs> I've got to say, I, I do think that, Jake, um, in, in the nicest possible way, I do think, is that the level of debate we're going to have about the BBC? <laughs> I think, really, it's going to be, did the BBC pay too much or too little? There's great... The, do the public care? Well, I, I, can I just make a broader attack on Jake? That I think, um, <laughs> I think, sorry, Jake. Sorry, but you're going to have to take this one. The, um, I think there's brilliant and fascinating and very important questions about the BBC. Its effect internationally, its effect on, on proper, important businesses that employ thousands of people in this country. There's very important questions we need to ask about the BBC, about how you, <clears throat> you know, what distinctive means, about what, how we cater for new generations, about how we encourage technological development, not just reflect what people currently have. There's fascinating, a fascinating debate to have about the BBC. It shouldn't be so black and white as to say, those, who we deny, those 70 families who we turned the BBC off for them, and hey presto, they said they missed the BBC. Really? <laughs> Is that the debate? Or does the BBC pay too much? I was at the BBC for 10 years, and it's the same question we heard then. I suppose the answer is, it depends what you want the BBC to be. If you want to have big shows that, that, where the nation come together, and that talent won't do it for a certain price, well, the BBC inhabits a market, they have no choice yeah. to, but to pay the proper fair rate. And, I'll say, for off-screen talent too. If you don't want to pay that, and you don't want to pay the market rate for Jane Lush, which is one and a half million pounds a year, you don't get Jane Lush. Nor should you expect Jane Lush to work for 100 grand a year out of niceness. Because, I, actually, I don't think that will get the best out of Jane Lush. We know she's money-hungry. But <laughs> so, so you think, surely it's horses for courses. But I, think, I think, generally, if either the BBC gets out of the market, and I guess, and signs people on 10-year deals, signs, or signs them at birth, and they have to work for the BBC for a pittance, <laughs> or food, and, you know... No, but what, hold on a minute. Or, if you're, if we're or talking, you let them be in the market but, and let them compete. But, but don't, but don't bollock talking, them either way. If I mean, we're it's talking crazy. about the BBC, which has not just a fixed income, but a decreasing income, yeah. you know, the, logical, the logic is the more and more we pay talent, 
the less money the BBC will have left to make the programme, to make the yeah, rest but, of the programme. But Jane, you know, and you, you know from when you were commissioning entertainment at the BBC and when, when I was running BBC Three, uh, the proportion spent on this talent far outweighs the amount of noise that journalists give it. I think it's, it's important, it's really important to audiences, and if the BBC is going to educate audiences, one of its key strengths is going to educate audiences, we need people who don't look like they work in a university with crazy hair 200 metres away. We, we know they probably need to look pretty good, they probably need to be trained, they probably need to be familiar, and that costs, and quite right it costs. The person's got a craft, you want to pay them a market rate for it. I, I, think, I think where there's an interesting debate is, should the BBC be in the market for buying formats? And it's, it's not a black and white yes or no as far as I'm concerned. Some they should, some they shouldn't. I think should they be in the market for American shows? You know. Sky's view is no, um, and the BBC have said that. I, I think there's, um, I, th I think the talent is a, an odd one. I, I, I don't know the mechanism by which we say to the BBC, I'm sorry, but at this point, the person's far too, far too popular. It looks like they're asking for 50 grand an episode. I'm sorry, the most you can pay is 25. What? So we get people who aren't the top of their craft. That's not the BBC I want. And I don't think it's the BBC Sky wants or anyone else here wants. Or the, or the viewers. Or the viewers, mm. more uh, importantly. As a talent agent who represents talent, I think most discussion about fees to talent is hypocritical and untrue. First of all, I think politicians, most of them sit in glass houses, because the second they stop being politicians or the other side comes in, the politician who criticises talent runs off to the private sector and gets the biggest salary they can. So they're just hypocritical. I also think politicians are totally hypocritical about ethnic and black people in television, because look at the House of Commons and how little non-white people there are. I think talent gets hired for a job and paid a salary. Most people who hire talent are on long-term or contracts with rights and protections, pensions and national insurance paid. So therefore, talent should get paid more per day, more per hour than the executive hiring them because they don't have job security. And ultimately, all jobs, whatever your skill set, are about supply and demand and your negotiating position at that time. If you're a quality chief executive, you get paid a lot of money to run a public company when you're a quality chief executive. In the same way, if you're a quality piece of talent, you should get paid the best rate you can get from the marketplace at that time. The reality is, for most talent, it will not last that long that they can get paid very high, and their, and their salary will, will drop fairly quickly because very few talent last that long. But I think it's absolutely fair for anybody, any work or walk of life, to get the best salary they can at a time for the job they offer. Do you put, you know, could you say, a this is the maximum amount of the license fee that could be spent on talent. You know, may, maybe it's something like that. I don't know. So there's a pot yeah. within which to work. I, but so long as it's tiny, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> and I would say if the BBC have got an amazing drama and they want to present that drama to the world and get the best possible actor to do that drama, you know, some could argue, you know, you mentioned earlier backstage, you love Ruth Wilson. I don't know what Ruth Wilson's fee is, but she may take the view, I'm not doing it less than a certain salary. Millions of people like, might, I don't represent Ruth Wilson, so I have no vested interest here. Millions of people like, love, might love Ruth Wilson, and they may, may want her in that drama, in that role. And if she costs more to be there, at this moment in time, her talent warrants it, like James Corden's does at the moment, or David Williams, they're the king, or Simon Cowell but there will come a time when they won't warrant such a big fee. The driver for talent is, is, you know, is not always this kind of um, uh, supposed big comedy checkbook. You know, if it is, it might be they need universal reach from ITV or Channel 4 um, in order to shift their DVD sales and recoup it at a, a later date. Often, we found, it's to do with whether they click creatively with you. And that's not just about giving them uh, unrestricted creative freedom, because that's not a relationship. That's, uh, that's just saying, go on our airwaves and do what you want. But it's about a great creative conversation, and that thrills people often more than the additional 20 or 30 grand an episode. I would also add, the Daily Mail often write how much talent get paid. People then quote what they read in the Daily Mail. It's normally not true. I know for a fact that the vast majority of talent is not paid that much. I'm not going to reveal what the BBC are paying per day, but I'm negotiating deals with the BBC at the moment. And if the public knew those true rates that talent were being paid, they would not be upset by that. And the fact is the Daily Mail never report the fact that the vast majority of BBC talent gets paid what would be a fair wage. They, they, they 
report wrongly massive salaries that they write in the beginning the talent gets, then they rewrite what was incorrect in the first place. So you have a whole spiral of discussion which is incorrect. Also, if a Daily Mail journalist, I use the Daily Mail as an example because the Daily Mail seem to love this, they'll do a survey, is so-and-so paid too much when they earn £40,000 a year? With all the people you ask are paid £25,000 a year, well, of course they, they're paid too much from the respondent that, that's been asked the question. So I would say, I think it's very hypocritical and untrue, most discussion about talent. We salary. should pay talent a lot more, actually. I think we've got the Daily Mail. Thank got, you, Stuart. Me, the Daily Mail's got their hand up at the back there. Let's get the Daily Mail speak. I just wanted to offer you the invitation to tell us those salaries so that we can report them correctly. <laughs> Who's that? Where are you? Catherine Rushton from, Hi, Catherine. from the Daily Mail. <laughs> Hi, Jonathan. <laughs> Go ahead. It's not for me to reveal the competition of my client's salary. <laughs> okay, so uh, from this very highly paid, highly skilled, highly <laughs> talented panel, thank you very much. Pleasure.